so I'm excited. Um, uh, welcome everyone to um, Jonathan's webinar that he let me kind of jump on to. This is great. Um, I'm excited to have, it uh, looks like a lot of friends here. I was just saying hi to some people. Um, I got Martha, Elizabeth, Lisa, Jean, uh, Aaron, uh, some really good people here. So excited to have you all here. Um, I've been uh, loving what I've been hearing from Titus uh, uh, Talent Strategies, and uh, Jonathan is always fun just to chat with. So at the very least today, you'll be entertained. Um, and so I'm hoping though there's a lot more than that. I've uh, been through the presentation, I'm excited about it, and I really feel like this is a big pain point right now for people. And so um, I'm excited to be able to look at this in a different way um, with uh, Jonathan. So all take right. it away. You're the man. Right. What? Well, thanks, Jim. And thanks to all Jim's friends and those of you who've joined and you don't consider yourself a friend of Jim, uh, maybe by the end of this time, you'll, <laughs> you'll want to get to know him. Um, <laughs> but uh, apparently we agreed that I would start this and then two seconds in, I go, Jim, why don't you start this? So we're off to a cracking start. Uh, it is good to be here. I am a, a massive fan of EOS. Um, we've been running on EOS for about eight years. I, I fall under that classic um, visionary who got hold of traction and said, I got this. I can change the, change the wheel on my a flat tire when we're driving along at 90 miles an hour. We got this. And it was a disaster. And so we brought in, uh, found out and discovered that we... Uh, there's this great network of implementers around the country who could help us. So we, we got an implementer and helped us go through, but we've been running, um, running on EOS as a company for eight years now and are so massively thankful uh, for EOS, not just from, for me as a visionary sitting in that seat, working with a phenomenal um, integrator who we've, we've worked together for 10 years now and uh, seeing that just running and humming along. But um, not only that and growing the company and we've, Inc. 5000 for the second year in a row now. Uh, and then suddenly COVID hits, global pandemic. And I remember saying to my integrator, I'm like, should we cancel um, next week? We've got our quarterly. Should we cancel that because of all this craziness? And he said, absolutely not. This is why, why we run on EOS. And I was like, oh, sorry. Yes, sir. You know, and I love the kind of submitting to the integrator in those times. And uh, it's been, it's been a, such a, a wild ride coming through this year. We're back to pre-COVID times as a company, uh, we made a, uh, our commitment to uh, be a, a premium sponsor for the upcoming conference um, in April. So I hope to see you guys there. But um, partner with Jim on this one, just because I remember one of the conversations we had was, what are some of the big challenges that your clients are facing and in the community? And uh, hiring and getting the right person in the right seat um, is kind of the, the you can get your people analyzer and your accountability chart and all of those things perfect, but it's the, the pre, how do I get the right person in the right seat? You know, how do I figure that one out beforehand? So we started asking EOS run companies um, the question of, so what's your process that's written down and followed by all when it comes to hiring? And it was kind of like crickets, kind of like, well, we don't really have one. Our visionary just does this kind of thumbs up, thumbs down thing. Um, and it is the classic, if you remember watching the Gladiator movie from 20 years ago, it's kind of like, no, we're not hiring. And we see a lot of that hiring process, which for any of you visionaries here, or you work with visionaries, I sit in that visionary seat. I think I'm amazing when it comes to gut feel on hiring. I, I can tell you within seconds if the person's going to fit. Sorry, they went all Trump then. Um, <laughs> I can tell you within seconds if the person's going to fit here. Meaning I can tell you if I like that person really quickly. There is no way that that is a process that should be followed by all when it comes to hiring. And so we've got to put a process in place. And that's, that's essentially what our company exists to do. Equipping companies to make fantastic attraction, hiring, engagement, and development decisions so that they can meet their people and performance objectives. My passion working with the EOS companies is there is one of the components, which is process. And another component is people. It's applying a, a, a greater level of process when it comes to hiring for the people component. So I'll jump into here. Some of the scary stats that are out there. You're all here because you know there's problems and you want to learn, learn and grow. Uh, so I won't go too much in detail here. I'll flash them up on the screen. But 80% of turnover due to bad hiring decisions, HBR. 74% of employers saying that they've hired the wrong person. Uh, that's amazing, isn't it? Oh, shoot, we hired the wrong person. And the dramatic cost of that not only on morale and engagement of your other people, especially if it's a critical hire, 
Um, I mean, would goodness me. And then 33% of employees quitting within the first six months. Like, what the heck is going on here? Um, are we making good hiring decisions? And I think a lot of it comes down to this whole uh, process. If any of you know Vistage, which is the CEO roundtable deal, they said 50%, uh, 56% of executive hires fail within the first 12 to 18 months. You think, what? You know, if any of you have had to hire an integrator, we do a lot of integrator hiring or critical leadership hiring for companies like 56% failing. Why is that? A lack of documented process. I mean, this is music to any EOS uh, run company, especially the EOS worldwide is a documented process that's actually followed by people when it comes to hiring. So we're doing this gladiator hiring and then wondering why it fails. So where we found companies getting lost is a, a misalignment. So there's a, a hiring team, but everyone's thinking something different. Everyone's got a different idea of what's ideal or the perfect fit. Attracting the wrong people, we have a, um, an approach of post and pray. We, we put together this job, we slap it out there in the world and say, come on, everyone apply. And we're attracting the wrong people. We're attracting B players and C players, not the A player. Uh, and then just no hiring process we already covered. So we, we all come here going, yes, we need top talent. We need to increase top talent. We need to increase this. But the whole thing is we just go into this quantity versus quality. Um, this is fascinating. If you have an HR person in your company or somebody who's responsible for the people component, we did this national survey around hiring. It said, what's the most important metric in your hiring? So what measurement are you actually looking at that's important to you? And it came back speed, cost, and quality. And so we said, okay, great. How are you measuring this? How are you, how are you actually measuring this component? You know, where does the pressure come from? Well, the pressure always comes on speed from the hiring manager. Like we need it now. Um, cost is important, but quality is really important. Everyone says, I know I'm supposed to say quality of hire is the most important measurement. Of course, it's more important than speed, but the pressure comes on speed and then quality becomes an afterthought. So we asked these same companies, uh, thousands of companies around the country through the big national HR organization. And uh, we had, the survey was, what is the, how are you measuring it? 90% said, retention is how they're measuring hiring. Now you just take a step back and go, so we're, if, you, if you remember the office space movie, uh, you know, people just sort of sticking around, <laughs> the guy who gets fired and he keeps working in the basement. You're like, so is, uh, which one are we, is he still, if he's still there, are we saying he's high quality then? I mean, he's not technically employed, but I guess he's still here. So he must be an A player. Like reten retention is a terrible measurement of quality. Um, it's just like those people you hang on to this old piece of <laughs> piece of equipment or an old toaster. And you're like, no, gosh, dang it, it still works. I'm not replacing it. It still works. It's quality. You know, it, it doesn't. It burns your toast every time. It's not working. Well, it's still here. It turns on, you know, and we treat people like that as if keeping them around is top quality. And I love EOS run companies. We're all about performance. We want to get the right people in the right seats and we want to perform. We want high performing organizations. So we take a step back and say, what the heck is quality then? How do we define it? And how can I increase my quality of hire? So we say it's about is these three things. You've never hired a resume before. No one ever has. And no resume shows up to work. You may have figured that out in your role. Uh, you go, where's the resume I hired? They didn't seem to show up to work. Yep, because there's a lot more to somebody than just a piece of paper. And so this whole dynamic, we say it's a third of each, a third of the, the briefcase or the, the, the background, the experience, professional choices, their work history. That's one third. Another third is about core values, the heart. So simple visual of you thinking of core values being the heart. And a lot of companies say, well, you know, we, we hire for values. And I'm like, really, uh, do you have a written down process to actually assess for that? Do you have a scorecard for that? For your hiring and i'm going to show you a scorecard for hiring today and everything i give you today is afterwards you, you're welcome to all of the blank copies and templates it has a process which we believe in knowledge transfer we're not a recruitment company we're a talent strategy company we love to empower and equip you to make great hires on your own so we're going to give you all of the templates for this as well and then the next one is the head which is behaviors and cognitive reasoning and making sure we're matching it to the benchmark of the role so that's how we bring it all together and it helps us as a visual and we actually bake all of this into our quarterly conversations, et cetera. So the four phase process, I understand. And it's an honor to hear that a lot of the implementers around the country have this printed out. We've, we've printed out, we've laminated it, sent it to them in the mail. They've stick it in their resource tab of their binders. 
as an example, just an example, here's a process that you can apply to the people component when it comes to hiring. And uh, I think that's that's something that we've learned internally and uh, a lot of our clients have too. So um, I'm gonna walk you through phase one and three. I'm not gonna get into the whole, the hunt and the recruiting. I'll, I'll touch on it a little bit, but um, we, we don't wanna give you everything. No, I'm kidding, we wanna give you everything. Um, so here's, here's the four phase process, okay? So, um, I started, you know, why do we hire people? I think it's a great question. I sat with our leadership team at one of our annuals a number of years back. Um, one of the mean things that EOS made me do was um, I had to answer the question that you've all got to answer as well is, what's our guarantee? What's our, our guarantee that you get with us every single time? Uh, and I was like, I, I, my integrator and our implementer kept asking and I'm like, just kicking the can down the road. I'm like, how am I supposed to guarantee people? I'll be a billionaire if I can guarantee people. Um, and so I'd always go, well, what if we just guaranteed that we'll follow our process? And I'm like, and my integrator, that's a stupid guarantee. We'll follow our process even if it doesn't work, you know? And I'm like, yeah, you're right. So we start, I said, well, why do we hire people? What's the point in hiring? Um, and so we started saying well, that somebody gets a job done. That's the answer. The right answer is we hire people to get a job done. Like how they do it and the values and the, the combination there, that is really, really important. We don't want somebody coming in, complete jerk, they get the job done and just have collateral damage everywhere. We don't want that. But we don't also don't want somebody who comes in and matches our values beautifully, but they don't get the job done. And those are some of the ones that are highly engaged, but low performers that we tend to keep around because ah, it's Johnny, it's Susie, they're wonderful. They're part of the furniture. I'm like, well, we really need to define what success looks like in the role. And we have that stuff on the accountability chart. We just take it a little bit, a bit, a bit more, um, a bit further that helps you bring definition to it so that you can interview better. So we talk about performance profile replacing the job description. Well, here's my job description. I'm like, usually that's a person description. Must have 10 years of this, must have five years of this, must have an accounting degree, must be able to close the books in 30 days, you know, whatever it is. Um, we can just zoom back and say, okay, what does the person need to do, achieve, or accomplish to be considered successful? Fast forward a year. By their anniversary date, what would make you say, that was a flipping good hire? What did they do? What are they, what's the outcome and the output? You could come that down to three to five things, really. Um, we say two to three. I and mean, the only reason we say two to three is because that's a part of our guarantee. We guarantee that the person will accomplish those by following this system. Um, and it's pretty out there, um, but um, we believe that if you follow the system, you can actually guarantee high level of performance of your people. So when we bring all that together, we then ask the question, remember we want to attract the right people? I want to attract A players. So why would an A player who's killing it somewhere down the road want to willingly consider leaving? Not because their head's on a chopping block, not because it's a terrible company or culture that they're a part of, but why would they want to consider leaving their great gig and coming over to our company for this role? And saying, oh, we've got a great culture doesn't really hook people. Uh, saying that you've got potluck on Thursdays doesn't hook people. Saying that you've got, you know, you treat your people well. I get all that. But A players make career moves very differently than Bs and Cs. So we've got to answer that question. Why would a top one? We bring all that together. We call it a performance profile. So I'll send you this template, how to craft this, how to build it out. Then here's this other one. I just think there's a biggest opportunity for, for EOS run companies. Take your VTO, um, get it from traction tools or IO, or you're using, you're using Google Docs, whatever it is, take that VTO and go, if I was to wave this in front of an A player who's working down the street, that's a pretty cool story. Uh, you, you're telling a story of who you are, your values, what your product is, what your, your marketing plan is, what are you, all of these things, your tenure, you're three year and you're telling this whole story. That's attractive for an A player. A players don't make lateral moves. They make futuristic moves. They're looking for a challenge on day one. They're looking for growth trajectory and they're looking to make an impact and be impacted upon. And so your VTO is something that every single one of you are sitting on. If you're not using it for recruiting A players, take hand it to your marketing department and say, if you want to sanitize some of the stuff on there, some of your stats, fine. But say, turn this into a hook. This is my marketing pitch for employees. Massive, massive opportunity. And you're sitting on a gold mine there. We, we do this every single time we work with an EOS company. We go, give us your VTO, scratch off anything you don't want. We'll just quickly turn it around with our marketing department just to hook. So uh, VTO, huge, huge, huge. Crafting performance objectives. 
um, think accomplishing, not having, like must have this experience. No, turn that around and think, this is what you will accomplish in this role. It causes people's eyes to come up and go, this is what the outcome is going to be. And it's really the stuff that's on your accountability chart, but it's just bringing a little, little bit more quantifiable-ness to it. That's not a word, but uh, I made it up. But a quantifiable ness, and you can use the smart goal format, specific, measurable, achievable, action, re relevant, time bound. And I, I throw the E on here because I think environment is another huge piece. It's the core value type stuff. This is what you, it's not just hitting these goals, it's in this environment with these type of people. So simple, you're hiring a customer service rep or an inbound call center rep. Um, to be able to say, you know, handle this call volume like respond to clients, respond to customers. You think, no, no, perform 20 inbound help calls per day to exceed $200,000 in product sales within 180 days. That's very, very specific. So somebody can go, wow, that's a lot more than I do, or that's way less than I do. I'm not interested in that role. That seems really boring. And this is where, you know, those stats at the beginning, we attract people and they're gone within six months. Often it's we've not clarified what the role expectations are by performance. So they either come in thinking they can do it or they come in uh, uh, thinking it's something that it's not. So, um, all right. So the employee value proposition is a big deal. So um, you, you've got to answer this question. Once you, This is all stuff before you've launched, kick into hunts, hunt phase or recruit. We need to hire someone. HR, get the old job description from seven years ago, slap it on Indeed, and let's hope that we attract A players. Not happening. It's just not how you're going to get an A player. So you've got to get this hook. Why would you think about your, you got to put your marketing hat on. You're going to try and get a prospect company to come and work with you, buy your product or service. Um, that's how we're going to come and attract an A player. We can't just go, hey, if you want to work with us, apply on our website. Apply on your website. <laughs> like, a player is not thinking that way. They have a job. They're not going to go through all of those hoops. You've got to get them to lean in. So this question, why would an A player want to move and join your, your organization? Bring that back to the VTO. I'll tell you why. This is our mission. This is our purpose. This is what we're going to do in the next three years. This is where we're going over the next 10 years. And here's the big kicker. We have a problem. We have a problem in our company. And the problem is this. We need somebody to come in and fix this issue. In 12 to 18 months, we need this thing fixed. That's what causes an A player to lean in and go, tell me more about this problem. Tell me more about this issue. I did this uh, for a, a company. It was a technology company in the UK a number of years back. And they said it's a very, very specific role they needed. And they needed, to, um, they needed this cutting edge technology. And there's probably only 10 or 20 people in the country that actually could help them fix this issue. And I said, all right, uh, A players want to be around winners right? A players want to be around fixing problems. I said, what if we rent out an upper room of a restaurant or a bar? We invite every single one of them, th these 20 people to this event, maybe half of them show up. And we say, here's our problem. We are one of the leading companies in this space. And here's our issue. And we'd love to invite you to a round table with other top people in the country and just discuss it with us. And for that, we'll give you X amount of dollars. Um, just as a consultant for two hours. And you just brainstorm with us. Of course, those people are leaning in. They're like, heck yeah, I'll come in. Number one, you're one of our competitors. Number two, you're inviting us into your issue, your, your war room. And I get to be around these other great minds. Obviously, now my goal is this. You have these top people in a room. That's who you're recruiting from. <laughs> so it's an interview for crying out loud. They don't know that. It's a flipping interview. So let's invite these people to this place. And we did that. Um, but it's thinking A players. How do I get and attract an A player? I, I'm, I, my history is attracting B's and C's. They're not bad. A lot of us run our companies on B's and C's, not, not Titus. All of us are A players. Um, but uh, so crafting this all together, I'll give you some templates on this, kind of the, the why you take your VTO and put it together like that. Your performance profile, not a job description, which is very, very clear. This is what the role is. This is the problem it's solving. Here's our big wicked problem. Oh, and by the way, in the first 90 days, this is what you're going to do, achieve or accomplish. And it's very, very clear. So essentially, you crafted this person's rocks for them before you even recruited them. But it's getting, when you tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, excuse me, would you be open? Can you imagine if you're, a, you're in Vegas and you're at a big trade show with all of your industry competitors and people in the space that you're in, 
you, you, you've been on the trade show floor all day. You've had all these prospects and customers come. You're done. You get in the elevator, you're going up to your room. You're somebody in the elevator and you say, hey, how was your day? Great. What do you do? And they mention that their job is exactly what you need to hire for. You're like, oh my gosh. You, you just, you want to kind of sort of, oh my gosh, here's my number. Call me. We're hiring. But that would be really weird and desperate, wouldn't it? We're hiring. I <laughs> think like, cool, I have a job. Thanks. You weirdo. I'm exhausted too. But you got, what's the hook? What are you going to get them to lean in and say, oh my gosh, uh, I, I, do you have plans in the next half hour? And they go, why? Why are you asking? You're like, can you meet me downstairs at the, the, the lobby bar? Why? Why are you asking? We're hiring. No, I, I'm not interested. But you're going to come and say something like, I need somebody who can do this. Uh, I got this big problem. I'd love to pick your brain on it. And they're going, sure, I'll meet you for a drink. So you're getting this person to lean in. That's how you're getting A players to respond. Now, I don't know if they're an A player, but I want to have a conversation about my major objective. So we always say stop hiring for culture fit. I know it's a little bit like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, no. We believe in core value alignment. Yes, we do. Um, we absolutely believe in that. But that's not the primary reason that we hire people. Culture fit is not the primary reason that we hire people. The primary reason is that a job gets done. So let's just define the job by performance goals and objectives and then be really clear on alignment. So that's why we talk the head, the heart, the briefcase. The briefcase is what's in the bait in what they need to do, achieve, or accomplish. The heart is about value alignment. And then the head is about behaviors and cognitive ability to ramp up. We happen to use the, the predictive index, massive fans of it. Full disclosure, we are a certified partner to sell, train, and implement. Um, we include it in our process. Whatever the assessment you use, make sure it's valid for hiring. I mean, it can be benchmarked. Um, there's some great, there about 650 assessment tools out there. Um, there are, they all basically do the same thing. You go, oh my gosh, that's me. <laughs> yes, you gave the information to the system. Of course, it comes out as you. You know, some are better than others. I get that. But for hiring, especially if you've got 50 employees, you need to follow EEOC and OFCCP compliance laws. You must benchmark the role first. If that causes your head to spin and you're nervous, like see me after class, you know, I'll, I'll explain that to you. It's really important that you follow the law on that, but benchmarking the job with the person from a behaviors and cognitive is really important. Otherwise you could be um, up for a nasty uh, lawsuit. So um, the puzzle piece here is, as I just described, what's the goal and objective? What are the values and what are the behaviors? All right. I am not pausing for questions. We will be taking 15 minutes of questions in a little bit here. Um, and if I keep going at this speed, maybe we'll have 20 minutes of questions. Um, trying to keep moving. I, I talk fast. If my uh, accent throws you off, I'm from England. Um, and uh, if you haven't figured that one out already, uh, this is not a Texas accent. Um, I did move to the States 22 years ago and somebody asked me where, where I was from. And I told them I was from England. And their next question was, oh, how long did it take you to learn English? which blew my mind. Um, and I was in Texas at the time. So I got a kind of an internal chuckle. I thought, I'm just going to humor this person a bit. And I said, oh, I picked it up as I went along, maybe 18 years or so. Um, and they said, oh, you speak English in England? And I said, yes, 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 we do. Uh, French in France, German in Germany, English in England. And I said, guess what? Guess what language you speak? And it was kind of like, oh, no, is this a trick question? <laughs> And I said, you speak American. It's our language. You stole it, screwed it up. So uh, I'm here to take it back. Anyway, no, I'm, I'm not. Uh, the revocation of your independence. That's why I'm here. Uh, but uh, all right. So looking at job performance indicators, a lot of companies, a lot of, let me say it this way, not companies typically don't think this way. Individuals think this way. A lot, a lot of stuff on there on bias. We do have bias. Everyone has bias, okay? And so some, some folk as individuals say, all right, education is really important to me. I want a smart person. Therefore, I need GPA to be at least this. Okay, there is, it is 12% predictive of performance. Uh, education, meaning the school that that person went to, and that's affinity bias. I went to this school. Therefore, I hire more people from that. I like them. They do better here. Um, and so or they, they came from this company. I came from that company. They've been trained like me. It is not predictive on the job performance, but having a structured interview, meaning a process, which we're talking about today, combined with a behavior and a cognitive ass assessment, now you're upping up to about 58%. You got a coin flip. No wonder we're doing such a messy job on hiring. We don't follow a process. So adding all of these components to process, behavior and cognitive assessment, and a structured interview, now we're on, now we're on something. I'm not gonna get into this. I'm gonna pass pretty fast here. 
um, just we, we use the predictive index because it benchmarks behaviors and gives us a range with all of our stakeholders. That's all. So I can get five or six people on a leadership team. We can all agree on the job. And now everybody gives their opinion in five minutes on um, on what behaviors they think are needed. And we can go, oh, interesting. Jim, why do you think we need this kind of wild maverick in this role? Um, and why do you think we need a hugely compliant person? Well, because it's a controller role. Why would we want a maverick in a controller role? Yeah, okay, good point. So then we adjust our behavior profile and then we benchmark candidates to that. That's the only reason we love it. It just helps us very quick and benchmark to the role, all right? So bringing all this together, um, bringing all this together is, um, is we've got our, our portfolio here where we now drafted the role by behaviors and cognitive. We've crafted the role by value alignment, which is the same every time you value. That's your core values right off your BTO. But just making sure when I say core value, let's say integrity is one of your values. I bet a lot of you have integrity or a variation of that word on your values there should be some definition of beha with behaviors tied to that because I mean, I've traveled to 45 countries and I know that integrity has a different interpretation or a definition by way of behaviors, depending where I go. Um, hey, I'm trying to find the bank. Where is it? And they go, it's that way, five miles. I'm like, okay. I get down there five miles. Where's the bank? It's told it's around here, five miles on the corner. No, 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 no. It's that way, 10 miles. I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, is that, is, you're violating integrity. No, it's just, there's something different. There's, the, the culture there is like, they just want to give an answer, not the answer. And I'm like, God, oh, it's driving me nuts. I can then suddenly go, I don't like that definition. You, you lied. So, but here's the reality. When I interview somebody, my definition of integrity for my company is to be honest, to be ethically unwavering and to inspire trust. Okay, so when I say, hey, it's Wednesday morning or Wednesday afternoon, you're interviewing with me. What did you tell your boss you're doing right now? Well, I just said I was at the dentist. Ah, interesting that you said that because you're not. Um, you're sitting here with me. And so by my definition, my business definition is you have not inspired trust, trust and it is not truthful. If I was to hire you, anytime you're going to the dentist, I'm assuming you're interviewing them. This is where a scorecard comes in around core value alignment. And it's really, really important that you define this. Very, very important that you define this as a foundation before you get into interviewing. Otherwise, everyone who interviews this person will end up in a thumbs up, thumbs down process, which is not a process. That is a gut reaction, hiring with your gut. I'm training you to hire with your head using a process and a scorecard. So... We, we use this blank scorecard for each section. You can customize this to you, however you want to do it, but it helps you in an interview going on a scale of one through five, is this person poor all the way through to elite? Our three is strong. Three is strong for us, but we, we have it blank for you. Um, and at the end of this, we'll have you, you can fill out this, this, we'll send you all of these. You've got all of the, all of the tools and resources, use them as you like, customize them as you like, but having each of your interviewers give a rating. And now you come back and debrief and say, let's debrief this candidate rather than going, make an offer. You know, no, 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 no. Let's just let's, let's confer together. Look at the scorecard. Does this person hit the mark or not? And if not, where are they missing it? Because you might find that their briefcase is a low score, but they've got a great core value alignment, great behavior. So many things are going for them. They just don't have the right level of experience. And you might say, there's so much alignment here. What if we put some scaffolding around them here, here, and here? What if we team them up with this person? Could the job get done? And you might say, let's do this thing. So um, that everything I've just done right there, that takes us, you know, it takes us a few hours of work to really craft the role following these process, which I've just given you is all in the templates. And we can give you guides on all of that, how to kind of go through it. And you're like, but fantastic. This is the role. These are the behaviors. These are the values. Now we can get in the hunting phase. Um, remember I said A players make career moves differently than Bs and Cs? Okay, this is it. They go for day one. It's got to be a bigger job than they've done before. They don't make lateral moves. It's got to be a bigger job. I say 10%. It could be 10 to 20% bigger. Um, you don't want to be going 100% bigger. They've never done anything like this before. You're like, oh gosh, that's a big, a big problem. But 10 to 20% bigger job. Next is growth trajectory. That's for the VTO. This is where we're going and where we're growing and where you get to be a part of this growth. They can see it in their mind 12 to 18 months down the road, not a promotion, but they will be stretched further. 56% of people who resign their jobs leave for growth opportunities. 
growth opportunities. A whole bunch of others leave for environment and manager fit, boss fit, but 56% leave for growth opportunities. That's huge. So we talk about stay interviews all the time. Like, do I know who my A players are and do I know what's next for them? Do I know what they think is next for them? Because I got to keep them dialed in and it's growth opportunities. Do they know how they're getting? That's where we talk about the VTO all the time. This is where we're going. This is what you're a part of. They can see growth opportunities. And then third is impact. Impact on them and impact on the world around them. So uh, they are going to make an impact on the world around them, meaning it can mean all kinds of things, but non-monetary. Don't just throw money at this. Otherwise, they leave for more money. Anyone who joins you for more money will leave for more money. It's logical, right? We don't want to play that the, the money game. We want to go, this is where you're going and growing. The money will take care of itself. Um, so... So the impact part is they get to see the impact on the world. We're not just making widgets. We are transforming the healthcare industry, whatever it is. And they can see those stories. So all right, pause here. Uh, avoiding post and pray, just going straight into, it's just throwing kind of a, throwing the opportunity online without crafting the role. Big, big mistake. Okay. 80% of people open to exploring a career move if it was truly superior to what they're doing right now. Here's the hint. That is our, the, the question that every one of our recruiting team members around the country, we're hundred percent remote company. We have just under a hundred salaried team members across the country. Um, we've been hundred percent remote for eight years, uh, which is great. We didn't skip a beat during COVID for that reason. Um, and, uh, but this question is the question we ask, would you consider a career move if it was truly superior to what you're doing right now? And every one of us can ask ourselves that question and go, well, I, well if it was truly superior, Great, we're just engaging in dialogue here. What would be truly superior then? I wanna know what that is so that I can see if it matches what I'm doing. And so I'm with, we're not selling jobs, we're having a conversation. Would you be interested in having a conversation about a career move if it was truly superior? Um, and many of you know who your A players are around you. You may be your competitors, people you've interacted in the past. Don't sell jobs, don't say we're hiring. You know, it's weird to show up at the bar and just have uh, 50 printed out cell phone numbers that you, here, call me, call me, I'm interested. Like, you're weirdo, I'm not doing it. You get people to lean in. If it was truly superior, would you consider this? So building your strategy, being proactive and collecting data is really important. As your company grows, you know, you know what your major objectives are for next year after your annual. You know the key positions that you need to hire for. You see the seats on your accountability chart. You've got no one in them. So you not need. don't go reactionary. Be proactive and build your strategy. Where are these people and how am I supposed to network with them? You don't need to pay a recruiting firm. <laughs> you don't. You don't need to go and pay those whopping big fees. You, you need to actually be build a strategy, be proactive, and, and collect a network. And I can teach you. We can teach you how to do this. So this persuasive messaging you know, day one and beyond the ro the better role trajectory where we're going. This is the, the, this is all on your VTO and more impactful work, therefore more intrinsically enjoyable. This is the impact of this role of what we're doing in the world. For us, we struggle. One of the things we struggle with at Titus is is meaning. People finding it really meaningful what they're doing because they go, well, "Aren't we just stealing one person from one company and placing them another?" Um, and it is a big part of what we do. Okay, we love strategizing with especially EOS run companies and, and dreaming about these things and building strategies and going and finding great people. But at the end of the day, our whole thing is how we how we help our people with meaning is this our VTOs, we want to give back $30 million into our people and communities we serve by philanthropic efforts by 20 in the next 10 years. That's our 10 year. And it motivates our people to type a greater meaning in what they're doing. Sometimes what they're actually doing, the work doesn't seem that meaningful, but the why and the purpose does. So always talking about your purpose in what you're doing. And that is a great hook as well, um, a, a great, good hook as well. So again, not going to dig deep into the hunting part, um, but I do want you to see this uh, last few minutes here, um, the process around structured interviews. So um, gut hiring, not good. Um, head hiring and process hiring better. Um, so um, as far as uh, this just slide here, just to hits on these things, the past predicting the present, um, you know, what have they shown their growth and impact? I'm going to give you the best interview question you can possibly ask anyone. Um, get ready, write this down. It's going to change your life. Um, you ready, ready, Jim? I'm in. Okay. All right. The, uh, it is, and you could, like you could do this right now with anyone here in this room. And I say it like this, I, I position it. I've got a call in, in a little bit of time here. Um, 
And I said, tell me, take a few seconds here. I don't want to rush into this one. Tell me your most significant career accomplishment. What is the most significant career accomplishment that you've ever done or made? Take a pause. It might be a story. It might be a season of time. It might be a project that you worked on. It might be a position that you had that dramatically impacted something. So, but what is the most significant career accomplishment? And, and I get them to stop and pause and think, and they go, got it. And this is a great one if you're hiring salespeople because they typically will go to their biggest sale. And salespeople can tell stories, right? That's why they're harder to interview because they can tell positive and inspiring stories. Um, I work from home and I have a dog. There you go. Um, so um, if you wonder what the, it wasn't my stomach growling. It could have been, but, uh, but so getting them to ask this, answer this question, say, okay, great. We're going to spend the next hour on that question. And like the next hour. <laughs> yes. The next hour I'm going to spend on that question. Um, and the reason it's going to take some time on this question is this. I want you to start to unpack that story and tell me the situation. So they say, oh, I arrived at this company. I'm looking at uh, this. This was the situation. Tell me the situation. Who are the players? What was the big problem that you faced? What, how did you tackle that first? How did you assess the issue? Who helped you get to that, um, get to the end result? What was the end result, by the way? And what I'm listening for in here is I'm asking questions around my major objectives that I've just established. Because you came up with three to five major objectives that were quantifiable with smart goals with them. And I want to know, can this person do that? I don't want to, I don't really care about their prior the stories and their education. I want to know, can they do that? I'm hiring them to get this job done. That's what I'm focusing on. So in that story, I'm listening for all the players. I'm listening for who the person, the biggest obstacle. And who was your biggest obstacle in that story? Because we all have a villain in our story, right? And part of why your story is so great, you overcame something. Was there a person that you had to negotiate with, maybe internal, external, uh, if it was a sales role, I was like, you know, what was the biggest obstacle in this? Who in the company that you were trying to close was your biggest challenge? And remember, it's their story, not my story. So here's where I'm getting all the references from. I'm like, oh, what was their name? What was that person's name? They go, oh, it was Sally. You know, Sally was the CFO. And she, man, I had to work hard to get Sally. I'm like, great, cool. Now, it was their previous situation. I have no problem going on LinkedIn and finding Sally and say, Sally, I just interviewed Bob Jones. And Bob said, the biggest deal of his life was with your company. And it was a million and a half deal in one sale. Like, no, it wasn't. They're like, oh, interesting. So I get to get my references from their story or call somebody and say, listen, you're a big hero in their story. They said this situation never would have happened if it wasn't for you. And people go, oh, that's very kind of you, kind of them to say that. And we're considering for a role in our company. I just want to give you, give me some advice on how to best manage this person. Anything, you can, tips you can give me. So I, I don't use people's references. Because I don't think that's very helpful, their aunts and uncles and all the people who like them. I want to take it out of the story. And uh, there are lots of, I can give tips around how to do this and how to tactfully do it. But this is where we get references from. But getting it from their story and finding out do, their major success, their biggest story of their life, where all of their endorphins were raging and they just were happy, happy, happy. Will they be happy in this role? Because my major objectives, if they're not in their story, maybe, maybe not. But if, if all of my major objectives are in their story, now I've got something to really talk about and I'm scorecarding this stuff. So um, I'm sure there are questions around that, but we'll get to them in a second. So I've already given you the one question interview. What's your most significant accomplishment? I'm going to leave this as interview questions for those from follow up. Um, you know, just simple, simple interview questions around leadership and productivity, humility and self worth. My, my encouragement to you is this, as you build out your, process for hiring look at your values as a company your core values and think what questions can i craft to look at those those behaviors in their life if excellence is one of your values how do you define that as a company by behaviors and you need to define it by behaviors if you're going to interview for it because you're looking for those that value to be demonstrated in behaviors either in their story or in the interview process so if you believe excellence the definition of that is like impeccable uh, communication skills in written and verbal form and timeliness cool that's easy look for it in your interview process we realized as a company that we uh, a lot of our, our team members role is communicating in writing to our clients about candidates and about process and all this kind of stuff and we didn't have anything in our interview process to see if they could write or not so we added it into our interview process to look at those behaviors and see if they met our standards of excellence. So 
Um, I'm sure there are questions there. These are the temp, the portfolio will give you that too. I've already covered that. Uh, so use some type of, the, I don't care what you use, use a valid assessment. It's a major, major component of your interview process. What goes on here? How is somebody going to behave when the pressure's on and the pressure's off? Jim asked me what my Colby score was before. He goes, oh, you must be an eight on a quick start. I was, I'm a 10, I'm a two, two, 10, five. And we're joking. I was already bored with the, before the first slide came up. I'm not bored. This is great. Um, and, uh, but I uh, wish it was a little bit more interactive, but hey, this is the nature of webinars. But, um, but, uh, but getting somebody dialed in and are their behavior, pre how they're going to function when the pressure's on or the pressure's off, no one's looking or intensity's there. I want to know how you're going to behave because I want to see if that aligns with the, what we need in the role. Um, the heart, crafting those interview questions to measure the candidate's values, motivators, and interests. Focus on culture add over culture fit for increased diversity. There's a little nugget in here. I know... Diversity, equity, inclusion has always been a challenge for, for us in the United States because we're in the melting pot. It just happens to be way more of a big highlight on right now um, this year. And so a lot of companies are coming to us going, help, help, help. You know, we have a webinar tomorrow on this whole process. But how do I increase diversity, equity, and inclusion? How do I eliminate bias in my hiring process? But think culture add, like what do I need? For, what am I missing in my culture by, by way of diversity and inclusion as opposed to fit? So we often go this, not a fit, you know, fit, not a fit culturally. And it's, it can be a bit of a hide behind like us versus embracing and saying, what are we missing? What are we lacking in here? And I want to, I want to have something. I interviewed somebody for our company, a direct competitor would be a leadership hire for us. They were a perfect fit. And I said, everything, you, ma you match head, heart, briefcase, you add nothing to us. I was like, what? You know, my, you, yeah, you could do it all, but you don't bring any different perspective. And we want a different perspective, diverse thought and perspectives because our clients are diverse. And it's kind of like, I guess that's it. Is this ne never now or is it never, never, you know? Uh, and I said, I don't know. Right now, definitely, I don't have a need for the same as. So interview question, single interview question. I've given you that. All of this portfolio is yours to keep. I think that's it. The close, I could say a load on the close. You or you know, ABCs of selling, always be closing. You're always closing. You're always leading, getting somebody to lean in, um, customize everything to the candidate. If you know all of those data points on the candidate, why they're considering this, don't just get let kind of HR fill out a job offer and send it on over. Uh, for us, I love talking about three-year job offers. Three-year job offers. Yeah, I want to say, once you've done this stuff, this is where we're going on our VTO. So you could go this direction, this direction, this direction. This is how you can help us get to the next level. And then three years down the road, I mean, phew, you might be on our leadership team if you keep doing that stuff because you'll be an A player, top performer, getting them to think the growth opportunity. So that's it. Uh, I'll leave this all in there. I'm going to leave some room for some questions here. Um, but uh, the whole, I, I think, um, I think I've caught most of this stuff, but getting feedback from candidates, that is, it's a two-way interview, especially now, right? Especially now. We're not saying apply online. I'm like, Hey, get, get you to lean in. You've invested some of your personal time to consider us. How can I help you? What are the, you know, getting somebody to get candidate feedback. Did you hear anything that was concerning? Any red flags? Here's a great opportunity. You get to find out who in your company is really good at interviewing or not. Candidates will sometimes tell you like, yeah, um, I met with your, your, your integrator uh, and they said this and I thought it was highly inappropriate. And you're like, wow, I, I guess that is inappropriate. We need some coaching and training on this, but getting feedback from candidates and so you can actually eliminate their concerns, et cetera. So um, ma manager feedback, very, very similar to really bring it all together. So that's the higher four performance process. We teach it, implement it at companies through workshop style. Um, and also just, I'm, I'm here, my team's here. Um, if you're not familiar with QR codes, I'm going to give you this right now. Open up your camera. Um, on your phone, point it at your, there you go. Um, I thought Jim was doing it, but he was just, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what's going on, although your camera's really steaming up and I, th I think it might just be my, my glorious glowing face. But, um, <laughs> but uh, so you point, point your camera at it and it's gonna suddenly bring up a, a website, click on that website and boom. It's going to ask you these things. I'd love to learn more about EOS. If you're a self-implementing company, maybe love to have an introduction to uh, some of these wonderful implementers who can help you on your journey. If you want these templates, we'll get this to you. If you want a compromise session with me, I'll, I'll happily give any of you 45 minutes 
Um, and then I charge a thousand bucks an hour after that. No, I'm kidding. I don't, but I'll happily give you 45 minutes to just answer any questions. If you, if you don't get to them in a second here, um, we are opening up for questions, um, uh, uh, to Jim or to me. Um, and then, uh, if you have critical hiring needs and you just want help figuring it, figuring it out, we're happy to do that too. So, woo, man, I did 45 minutes. Boom. So you hit it right. There is a question actually. I want to um, Bill um, asked that I thought it was a really good one, and I'm actually curious about the answer. So Bill and I have this question. Um, in addition to the VTO, do you share the accountability chart with the prospect? I'm guessing you're obviously going through the roles, but do you show the whole organization? That's an interesting question. Um, I would like to put that back to Bill. Probably, you know, what are the pros and cons of that? I've not shown. No, I, I, I did this past week with um, getting somebody I thought was an A player. I, I showed them uh, our, uh, um, so we have two sides of our business, hire for performance as a service we provide for our clients. And the other side is manage for performance, which is all on the post hire through year, end of year one and anniversary day. We, we track performance of everyone we recommend to our clients. We want to make sure they hit it. It's part of our guarantee. We guarantee that performance thing. So we've got to track it on the back end. Um, and I was showing this candidate all of this so I could help him see where he fits in the organization. And then I did. I, we, we used traction tools. So I opened up traction tools. and I said, I'll, I'll navigate you through. I showed him VTO, full transparency. And I showed him the accountability chart where, where he would fit and what seat he would be in so he could see the big picture. I, mean, I, I, mean, I think it was probably helpful to see it, um, see it that way and see um, who his peers would be, et cetera. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Jim, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's funny because where my head went right away is if um, if you can show them growth um, from the accountability chart. So they're coming into a hundred person organization and they're going to be you know mid-level manager. We see these positions opening up at some point. This person's moving. We see some retirement here. If they can see the growth, I think yeah. that goes back to, um, you know, show them that there'll be growth, show them to be stretching. If I'm in for a career, I want to see that I'm stretched many years in advance. So that was a little where my head went. Um, uh, but if you don't have that, then it can work against you too. So <laughs> you got to watch. Yeah. Um, and so in, in my, you know, based on what I've done and what I've seen some of my clients do, I guess it would depend. Um, but that's why I was really curious to your answer. So, yeah, I mean, it's, inter it's interesting. I think this whole topic of A players versus Bs and Cs. Mm -hmm. um, I what I have found is when somebody's a real A player, they're not asking just about day one. Mm -hmm. okay. A players care about the future, and that's why the VTO is such a glorious gift to talk about the future. Because they, if 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 they're not asking about where next, they're probably running from something, not to something. Yeah. Um, and so again, you kind of like somebody. I was one of our EOS clients the other day because I'm looking for a, a climber, not a camper, because I got a lot of campers. I want a climber here. I want somebody who's thinking, and I was like, cool, well, we'll be able to tell if they're a climber. How? If they're asking about the future. If they're not asking questions about the VTI, they might not know that language as a candidate, but if they're not asking about the future of the organization, where are you going? Where are you growing? What are you doing that's impactful? Then they, I, would want, I would argue that they're probably running away from something, and this will be a rebound relationship employment relationship as opposed to this is this is everything I want so love it okay um and, and then Scott is there a way to um unmute Scott I, I don't know what form of zoom we're in right now but if there is it'd be great if we could just ask him because he asked another question about how about showing the org chart to a potential um I am not I don't know what an org chart is I'm gonna use simple matter there it's an accountability chart to me Scott what you, <laughs> what's your question there I don't know what it is uh, yeah, I guess an org chart and an accountability chart, same thing. So essentially, um, you know, I mean, I do that. I just did that recently on a hire. You know, we're interviewing for a specific position, um, but I can tell the candidate, at least from my perspective, was looking for a growth opportunity or at least to know that there is some growth opportunity within the organization. And so what I did was lay out the org chart or whatever you want to call it, the accountability chart and showed them the different seats that are still open and that are available uh, that if, you know, we decide that that's a good progression for them, then that might be an option for them. So just to see what's open and available. Is that a good exercise or is that something that is probably a little overboard? I like it if it shows growth. I mean, what you just said is actually kind of what John and I were just saying. I, I, I like it if it's showing growth, if it's, um, 
not, and you can kind of show growth in the organization and maybe the seat doesn't exist, um, kind of where your head is. You know, Jonathan being a visionary, he's probably seeing, you know, a number of years out in, in advance. And so he can kind of see some things coming. And so um, if you're a visionary, sometimes that can help as well. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. So sometimes a visionary can see where the company's going, but the seat isn't open today. Yeah. And that can be hard because you come like, oh man, this would be, how do we just get them in the organization today, even though the seat's not there? Well, yeah. that can be, I mean, it can be challenging because other people around the company going, why did you hire that? What is that? You know, what is this seat? And you're kind of talking in this futuristic sense of seats that may open and so, yeah. Uh, well, I, well, I, no, I, I'm referring to, to seats that are actually open within the within the accountability chart, um, not necessarily seats that are that are that are in my head. Uh, although I do generally have seats in my head that I that I pop out every now and again, but I usually do those through an L10 meeting, and then I get yeah. that through to my integrators so that that we can get them onto the you know onto the proper process of getting through and vet, vetting whether or not that's an actual seat we need to fill. Yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, Thank you. I, I, I think it's, I think it's great. anything that you can show vision and growth, story, purpose. Uh, I think that's, that's how you're going to get some, an A player to lean in. And uh, so I, I would say, I would say, yes, if you know, you've got somebody, they need to, they need to lean in and see the whole story of where you're going and that kind of transparency. I've, I've had nothing but positive when I've shown somebody our VTO in the interview process. And they're like, wow, you're, you're entrusting me with this. It seems very intimate, yet the whole company knows it, you know, it's because it's, it's yeah. kind of part of the transparency of running on EOS that everybody is rowing in the same direction because they all know where you're going, not just what we're doing today. Um, so it's, I think it's a great recruiting tool. Okay. What else? Any Small. other questions here? I think Scott's solved. Um, if not, Scott, let us know. Um, and Cherish also has one. Does asking them where they told their current boss they went during this interview cross any legal lines during the interview? <laughs> the correct the correct answer for me is this: um, <laughs> is I told them, you know, e either they completely trust me, they didn't ask what I was doing. <laughs> That'll be a good answer. Um, um, I don't actually need that level of check in, check out. But if your company culture is a, what are you doing in this time block? I, was, I had a personal point with, I had something personal to get, tell the truth. You don't have to say, I'm in an interview. Uh, it, was a, it was a personal appointment I had. That's it. Now, That's is it but that. is it bad to ask that question in an interview? So you're interviewing somebody. Would you ever ask that question? I would, do. Would yeah. you tell your boss? I absolutely do, yeah. Um, okay. Because, because one, of my, one of our values is integrity. We tell the truth. We're honest. We're ethically unwavering, and we inspire trust. If there's anything in the interview that violates that, I'm going to dig in further and go, can you clarify that for me? Can you clarify that? Could you explain that a little bit more? Could you expound on that? Because I want to know if that, they live that value because I have a promise to all of our team members, close to 100 salary employees, the day we hire somebody, that everyone knows that to the left and to the right, they have people that live our values. That's, that's the people analyze the stuff. Yeah. Uh, and so we have to prove that we've actually followed a process and there was a scorecard assessing every one of those values. Now, is it 100% perfect? I mean, it's, it's, certainly there are people out there who go, wow, there are white lies. And I go, well, no, there are lies. That's what there are. That's my value system. And I want that running through our organization. What, you, you know what I'm saying? I think putting yeah. it in, in a process is the important, important thing. And, and Hannah says it is legal. Um, you just, it's tricky. Um, and so the, the question is legal. Um, I my just from uh, the experts, they say it is. Yeah, uh, this is what I'm actually super intrigued to ask you, Jonathan, because um, uh, I think this is needed in some other organization. So let me tell you just my belief, and then I'm gonna explain Aaron's question. Right. Cool. I believe all organizations have to have two pipelines. They need to have a pipeline of current customers, so new customers coming in, prospects, and they need to have a pipeline of great people coming in. Yeah. Um, that's my belief. Um, and so um, Aaron asked the question, how do you get your visionary to agree to be proactive in searching as opposed to post and pray? I need help to persuade. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, other than giving me a little bit of time with them, which I would love. Uh, but, um, but I think the statistics that I showed at the beginning can help. When people realize there's a problem, um, for years, you can tell me it's really important to be healthy. 
Um, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know that, you know, yeah, yeah, I know I need a pipeline. Yeah, I know I need to upgrade my talent. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if you tell me I'm sick and I've got a major health problem and if I don't adjust something, I'm going to collapse, I'm going to listen now. So you suddenly put a bit of, you know, wake up call to me and I'm going to start exercising, care about what goes in my body. Like we all know that health is health and wellness is important. And we all know great people and A players are really important to our company. But unless you actually take a stop and say, okay, what is the cost of a bad hire? What is the cost to my organization? What is the cost to be not hitting our performance goals and objectives? What is the cost? Uh, when I look at our accountability chart and our VTO and I look at it and go, which, where, I, I want to press a button. So I, this is, this is, us. I want to press a button. I said this a few years ago that showed me ha- um, everybody in the company who's hitting hundred percent of their performance objectives. Um, and it's basically kind of red, green, yellow of the accountability chart. Um, but I want to know the cost of the loss. I know who my A players are, but I want to know the cost of my B's and C's. Um, and that motivates me to go, Ooh, I need to have a B more proactive in my hiring. Um, and I need to know who my A players are because I need to make sure they don't leave. So I need to actually bring um, a magnifying glass on that. So I think sometimes it's just the fear of fear of the, um, when I understand the cost, it's like engagement. For years, people have been talking about employee engagement and it kind of like, oh my gosh, beanbags and potlucks. Like really, what do they want now? What do the millennials want? You know, um, and a lot of uh, visionaries and integrators, you know, older generation can be like that. Going, what do they want now? But um, if you actually say, listen, the, 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 this is what it's costing you to not deal with this. I'm like, all right, fine. Um, performance is a huge part of it. And that's why we, we focus on performance and value alignment. Awesome. Um, Aaron, hopefully that you're solved. Uh, if not, I got some really good stuff there. Give me a call. <laughs> yeah. Aaron works at one of my clients. Um, okay. And uh, it looks like we have, I'm doing my math right, about one minute. Uh, Scott, I see that you do have another question. Uh, good Aaron says that she's, uh, uh, looks Ooh. like she's solved, but she'll give me a call. Um, and Scott has one more question, but um, I'm a little worried about time. I want to make sure I'm good to everybody's time because three o'clock is here. Um, but um, the um, maybe we can get back to Scott or do it now. You tell me, Jonathan. Um, I, I can, well, I can get back to Scott. I'll get back. I mean, I love this topic. I, I just got okay. asked this uh, Did you recently. answer it quick? Yes, maybe yes or no. Do you is think it that possible? All people in an organization should be A players? Um, I would just say, what is an A player? It's somebody who got, it's your job done. Define the job. Like, I'm not talking about 150%. I'm saying, what is 100% for every single person in the organization? Uh-huh. Everybody needs a number. So if everybody hit their number at 100%, are we all A players? That's how we treat it. Sweet. So yes. <laughs> um, perfect. Um, hopefully that answers it, Scott. You know, please reach out to us. Um, do we have contact information here uh, somewhere? We're going to be sending that out to people. Um, anyone who registered, we can we can get. I mean, do do click on this. We'll make sure we're not. I would not bug you, but if I'll send you what you're asking for. But if you if you'd uh, want to contact us, you can find me on LinkedIn, Jonathan Reynolds, Titus okay. Strategies. We're all good. Yeah, and it looks like if we I, I went out to your QR code too. So um, if we we probably put that in too. You can put in a question. So yeah, this is great. Um, and so Hannah's just letting us know that uh, they'll be sending out a recap or recording of the presentation. I know I had a couple of clients that said they needed to go. So that's great. Um, this was awesome. Thank you, Jonathan. I really appreciate it. Hey, welcome. Thanks for having us here. Thanks for partnership. We love it. We love yeah, it. This is good. This is good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and if there's other questions, please do reach out to um, Jonathan and his team. He's got a whole bunch of smart people surrounding him. Um, that are great. So please do that. Good stuff. Thanks everyone for joining. Have a great one. We'll see you at the conference in April. Hopefully uh, we'll get to see you there.